Now that we are familiar with sigma notation, let's take a look at some summation properties and formulas. Let's start by going through some basic properties with summations that you should be aware of. And a lot of these are things that you may have seen before, um, say when we were dealing with derivatives and integrals. For instance, here, if I have some constant multiplied by a value that is dependent on the value of k, it's okay for me to take that constant and move it to the outside. So here, just as I would with an integral, I can take that constant to the outside, then evaluate the sum, and then multiply that sum by the constant. Another property, and this one's very important, if I'm taking the summation as k goes from one to n of just some constant, then essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking c times n because what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with c n times because the first one would just be c and then when k is 2 I would just have c and when k is 3 I would have c and that would continue on until I had n total c's. So n times c is what happens if you have just a constant. If I have two different summations Again, using the same limits of, of the summation, it's okay for me to break those up. For instance, say I have the summation as k goes from one to n of two k plus three. I can break this down into the summation as k goes from one to n of two k, which of course I could use that property and put the two on the outside and say two times the summation of k. And then I could add to that the summation as k goes from one to n of three, where I would obviously be using this property. The next um, property says if I have the summation of some sequence, I can split the sequence into two parts, as long as those two parts cover the entire limits from lower limit to upper limit. So here, if I start at one and go to some integer j, and then in my next one, I go from the very next integer up to n, and that's all this is saying is, hey, you're going from your lower limit. In this case, my lower limit was one, but it wouldn't have to be one. So lower limit to upper limit and j, is between those two values, and obviously j plus one is between those two values. The last one is deceptively complicated, um, but it's something that you might use from time to time, because as we go through some of the formula in the next couple of slides, you'll find that some of the formulas start at zero and some of the formulas start at one. And so it might be that I have to add or subtract some value from this lower limit of integration to make it equal zero or one. So I can add m or subtract m, I've just shown addition. I can add the same value to each of those limits of integration, but then I'm going to have to subtract the value here. So let's take a look at our first summation formula that says if I want to find the sum of as i goes from one to n of i, then all I have to do is take n times n plus one divided by two. So let's just look at a practice where let's say n is seven. If n is seven of i, then that's saying start at one and continue to increase by one all the way up until you get to our upper limit, which in this case is seven. Now I can easily add this in my head or using a calculator to find that the sum is 28. But of course, the summation formula comes into play when I can't just find it by hand. If I need to actually use the formula or quite often we're going to use these formula in proofs and so of course the formula is important. Now let's take a look at the formula and why it works. I'm going to add one through seven again. So I'm going to add it twice. And the second time I add it, I'm just going to add it in the opposite order 
that I added the first time, which of course, as we know, is going to still give me 28. What happens is if I then add 1 and 7 and 2 and 6 and 3 and 5 and 4 and 4 and I continue, I'm just going to get a bunch of 8s. And how many 8s am I going to get to add together? Well, I'm going to get 7 of them. And what happens is then I'm taking 7 eighths added together, which I could rewrite as 7 times 8. And then because I've added it twice, I just have to divide by 2 because I've found twice the sum, so I have to divide it by 2. That's all this formula is telling me. So this formula says as i goes from 1 to 7 of i, I'm going to take n, which is 7, times n plus 1, which is 7 plus 1, or 8, and I'm going to divide it by 2, which is 56 divided by 2, which is 28. So we get the same value, whether we're using the sum written by hand or using the formula. The next summation formula has to do with i squared. I'm not going to go through with you like I did for the last formula where this formula came from just because it would take about 15 minutes and I don't want it to be that long of a video. But I do want to do one practice with you just to show you, not prove that it works, this is not a proof, but just to show you that yes, in fact, at least for four, it works. So if I were going to do this by hand, this says start at one, square it, and then continue to increase until I get to four. So 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16, which is 30. So now I'm saying let's use this formula that says n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6 should also give me 30. So n is 4, and then I'm going to take n plus 1, which is 5. And then I'm going to take 2n plus 1, which is 2 times 4, or 8, plus 1, which is 9. And I'm going to take that product all divided by 6. Well, 4 plus, I'm sorry, 4 times 5 is 20, times 9 is 180. And 180 divided by 6 does give me 30. So we have verified that at least for the value of 4, that this summation formula works. Now, before we move on, I do want to point out that though these formula are great for exactly what we did here, which is finding the sum, they're also great because when we're working on proofs and things of that nature, I am able to replace the summation as i goes from 1 to n of i squared with its equivalent counterpart, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. This is the last formula I'm going to go through with you, but just know that this is not an exhaustive list. So I just went through some of the big ones that we'll, go, that we'll use quite often in this course, and this one for sure is one that we'll use often. This is the summation formula for a geometric progression, or as we called it earlier, just a geometric sequence. And just to refresh your memory, when we learned about geometric sequences, we said to find a sub n, we're going to take a, which was our first value, our initial value, and we're going to multiply it by r to the nth power. And that's what a geometric sequence was all about. And if you'll notice, that's what I'm doing, is I'm finding the sum of the first n terms of a geometric sequence. And according to the formula, to do that, all I need to do is take a times r to the n plus 1, I'm going to subtract a, and then I'm going to divide by r minus 1. So I put an example here, and I purposely made this example a little bit more difficult. This should have parentheses around it. I made it a little bit more difficult because I wanted you to see the kinds of questions that you might get. And so we are going to use this new summation formula, but we're also going to use one of the properties that we learned in this video. So if you'll notice, I have the summation of essentially two different sequences. So all I'm going to do then is write this as the summation as k goes from 0 to 7 of 2 times 3 to the k. And then I'm going to switch colors so we have a different color to work with, plus the summation as k goes from 0 to 7 
of 5 times 2 to the k. And again, that's just one of our properties that says if you have two different summations, it's okay to break them up. Before I continue this question, one thing I do want to point out that I possibly didn't point out earlier is this summation formula starts with k at 0. Some of them start with k at 1. But when we went through the properties and I said you might have to alter your sum to make it work, this is what I'm talking about. So if this one didn't start at 0, I might have to do some tinkering around with it. But thankfully, we're not going to do that in this example. So now I'm going to just use this formula. This formula, of course, a is 2 and r is 3. So let's use the formula. I have a, which is 2, times 3 to the n plus 1, so n is 7, so this is to the 8th power, minus a, which is 2, and divided by r minus 1. r was 3, so 3 minus 1 is 2. That's the first part. For my second summation, a is 5, r is 2, and so I'm going to have a, which is 5, times r, which is 2, to the n plus 1, again, n is 7 from here, so 7 plus 1 is 8, and then minus a, which was 5, and divide it by r minus 1, and r was 2, so 2 minus 1 is 1. So from here, I'm just going to use a calculator. I'm going to take 2 times 3 to the 8th, subtract 2. This gives me 1, 3, 1, 2, 2, minus 2 over 2, which turns into 6,560. Again, using a calculator, 5 times 2 to the 8th minus 5 over 2 minus 1 gives me 1,275, and when I add those values together, I end up with 7,835. Now, is this the only way I could find the summation of that? No, I could do this the long way, of course, and I could say, what's the first value? 2 times 3 to the 0 would be, 3 to the 0 is obviously 1, and then 2 times 3 to the 1st, and then etc. And I'm not going to do it because there's no purpose in doing it. I could verify that my sum is in fact 7,835, but I'm not going to. Just know that I'm choosing to use the formula instead of to find the first seven values. I wanted to summarize some of the useful summation formula that you might be using. And Today in our video, we went through the geometric progression. We also went through as k goes from 1 to n of k. Now we used i and i, but notice it's the exact same formula. And we also used i squared, or in this case, k squared. We didn't go through the other three, but just know that these are also formula that you may use. Um, and if you take combinatorics, which is essentially discrete math two, we use all of these. Um, but I did want to just highlight the three that you'll use most often in this course. Coming up next, we're going to switch gears again and take a look at matrices and matrix operations.